we know now today that the Earth is approximately four, four billion years old. Um, and we, uh, here in Franconia Notch, the oldest rocks uh, near the notch or in the notch are around uh, 400, between 350 million and 400 million years old. And so between 400 million years and 4 billion years, we have absolutely no record of the Earth's history here in Franconia Notch. The, um, the Conway granite was intruded into these very old rocks. These old rocks, by the way, are mica schists and gneisses generally. But the Conway granite that we see so much of in the notch was intruded into those older rocks about 150 million years ago. Uh, the Conway granite took about 50 million years to really cool so that it became granite and the joints and fractures that we have discussed formed in it. Um, and um, it took about 150 million years of erosion to bring the Conway granite up to the surface of the mountains that we see today. Um, this, this is a process of eroding on the land surface and as rocks are eroded away and the weight is lessened, the crust uplifts itself and replaces itself so to speak so that the mountains here may never have been a whole lot higher than they are today. Um, we really have no evidence, however, of how high they were, um, as you do in other parts of the world where you can go and look at huge masses of sediment that have been uh, eroded out of mountain ranges. Here in New Hampshire, we're not that lucky, and we have to guess. Um, as the Ice Age began, ice began to move from the north to the south, and as it passed through Canada, southern Canada or northern New Hampshire, it had very little in its way to interfere with its flow until it got to the White Mountain Front, which is immediately north of Franconia Notch. At that point, the glacial ice, because it's a plastic solid and flows um, a sort of like uh, warm putty, uh, found the paths of least resistance through the mountains. And Franconia Notch, because it was deeper, uh, formed one of those early paths. Franconia Notch is one of the best examples we have of a, of a glacial trough. You can see its characteristic U-shaped valley behind me. Uh, this valley was eroded by the enormous weight of the glacial ice at the height of the Ice Age. At that time, Franconia Notch and all of the White Mountains were covered by nearly a mile of ice, an enormous weight. And that enormous weight is what accounts for the smoothing, the rounding and the smoothing that you see in the topography here. About 11,500 years ago, we know that the Notch was ice-free. Uh, we know that because we've been able to date organic material from bogs and lakes to the, in the area north of the notch uh, where organic material began to accumulate around that time. That means that those areas were ice free so plants could grow and that means Franconia notch was ice free at that point as well. Now at that time another process, very important process took over, a uh, very modern process called mass wasting. Uh, mass wasting in Franconia notch depends on two things. The first is that the Conway granite um, is very susceptible to, to disintegration and weathering uh, from simple rainwater. Rainwater attacks the granite and dissolves the potash felspar, which is one of the minerals that makes up the granite, and the granite begins to fall apart. If you walk around Franconia Notch very much, you'll see lots of this sort of gravelly material, particles about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch in diameter that look like gravel. Uh, this is actually Conway granite that's disintegrated into a gravel from stones uh, because of this process. The second process is what we call freeze-thaw wedging. And this happens uh, when water goes into a crack in a rock um, and freezes at night when the temperature cools off. The water expands. Uh, the next morning the water thaws out and drips down into the crack a little further, freezes the next night and wedges that crack open. Well, as that process continues day after day after day, eventually the crack is wedged enough so that the piece of rock will fall off of its, um, its uh, host rock, and we've got two pieces of rock instead of one. Uh, those two processes are responsible for the formation of the Cannon Cliff and the enormous talus slope at its base. Boise Rock um, is actually a piece of Conway granite, uh, which slid down into Franconia Notch uh, probably from the Cannon Cliff sometime early in this process of freeze, freezing and thawing and wedging off pieces from the mountainside. Um, it slid down into Franconia Notch and took up its position next to what is now the road. Um, the shape of Boise Rock is very important to its history uh, and the shape was created by a combination of frost wedging and chemical weathering of the granite. 
the smooth uh, uh, sort of cave that's formed in the, in the underneath part of the rock is a result of, of water going underneath there, rainwater or fog or any sort of moisture going underneath there and decomposing the granite so that the individual mineral grains would fall off of the roof of what is now the cave. If you crawl underneath Boise Rock and look around, you'll find that the floor of that cave, sloping floor, is all covered with this little quarter-inch gravelly particles, which are the residual of the weathering of the, of the rock itself. Uh, the shape of the rock is, is, is slightly curved from, from, long, from the two long dimensions um, because the center of the weathering was, was near the center of the opening in the rock. And it's gradually opened uh, slowly and gradually outwards as you see it today. Uh, I felt, as a matter of, of science, that I was in the presence of an utterly remarkable, completely remarkable scientific and natural phenomenon. Uh, I know of no other rock structure in the world that uh, was formed like the old man, um, that had so much weight, cantilevered out over a thousand foot high cliff, and it stayed there uh, for, you know, many hundreds of years, apparently. Now, this is an utterly remarkable process. Uh, when you think about the fact that it's completely natural um, and completely random. Uh, nobody had any control over the processes. It all had to do with the natural rate of disintegration of the granite and the exact order in which the rocks fell away from the profile. These same processes are the ones that caused the demise of the old man. The small rock bench on which the entire 7,200 ton rock mass rested uh, was also susceptible to these two processes and eventually it crumbled, uh, causing the, the weight of the old man that it supported to collapse into the valley below. My, my time with the old man has, has lasted for about the last 35 years. I started uh, in the mid-1970s with the rock mass stability studies on the old man that were conducted in conjunction with the environmental impact statement for Interstate 93 and its alternatives through Franconia Notch. It continued uh, 10 years later in the mid-1980s when I designed most all of the rock blasting that took place underneath the old man during the time of the construction of Interstate 93's parkway. Uh, and then, of course, when the old man collapsed in 2003, I was called upon to try to sort out why the old man collapsed, how he collapsed, um, and to try to put some closure to the, to, to the old man's life. Uh, we know from the studies that we have conducted over these years that the processes that created him and that brought him down were in fact the same processes and that these processes are very dynamic and they're continuing every day. Um, we suspect based on the speed with which the rock mass deteriorated between 1976 and 1986 that the old man may not have really been that old. It's possible that the old man may have been less than 500 years old um, and, and, and a very recent development on the cliff. Uh, during the 1970s studies that we did on the stability of the old man, uh, we spent the summer rock climbing on the profile and measuring, physically measuring all of the rocks, uh, rock slabs that made up the profile. In other words, their dimensions, horizontal and vertical dimensions, uh, and their attitude on the cliff. In other words, how they dipped back into the cliff or dipped parallel to the cliff or whatever the case might be. Uh, we were able to take those measurements back to the office, uh, draw them up on um, uh, drafting paper, and project uh, their, their uh, limits back into the rock mass by projecting them from the surface. Uh, we use these numbers, uh, these blocks, dimensions I mentioned, we, and we put them together and created a series of numbers that told us how stable or unstable the old man actually was by analyzing these blocks of rock piled up on top of each other in the same orientation that they actually were in nature. Um, we, of course, were not sure of the accuracy of those estimates until the old man collapsed. And when he collapsed, unfortunately, for all of us he collapsed, but when he did, we were able to conduct a bit of an autopsy. And at that time, we were able to find that the projections of the slabs that we had made were quite accurate because the pieces of the old man that did collapse were approximately the size and shape that we had predicted they would be. The other interesting thing about the old man was we predicted that he would topple off the mountain instead of slide off the mountain and that's precisely what happened. When the small bench of uh, Conway granite that held up the back corner of the, of the chin block uh, was, uh, 
uh, crumbled and weakened by frost wedging and the deterioration of the granite, and it lost its intact strength. The 7,200 tons of the old man were no longer supported. The chin and upper lip toppled forward into the valley, and of course, once that happened, the rest of the old man also toppled forward. Uh, we know he toppled forward for a couple of reasons. The most obvious one is that the, the staples on the feet of the turnbuckles that used to sit in the forehead were pulled out and curved backwards. Uh, so that as the old man's forehead rolled forward, the staples pulled out this way so that their, their curvature tells us where the rock moved before they pulled out. Uh, the other thing we know about it, and basically backing up the notion that he toppled, is that there was lots of uh, decomposed granite on the rock surfaces inside the old man's rock mass itself, indicating that the, uh, uh, probably the wind was blowing cloud water into the fractures in the rock inside the cave underneath and behind the chin, uh, and that over, over the uh, hundreds of years that the old man was there, the granite deteriorated once again by the chemical weathering and the frost wedging, so that um, rotten stone or this uh, rotten rock was forming inside the old man itself. So the old man's structure was being compromised not only by things that were happening outside, but these weathering processes that were underway inside. I felt very responsible for, the, for, the, for figuring out how the old man formed and how he stayed up there uh, and what it would take to make sure he stayed there. Uh, we spent, I spent a lot of time, uh, sleepless nights and all of that kind of thing. It, was, it became a very, very personal um, adventure. Um, a, a real highlight of my career. Um, I was scared at times. I was uh, uh, unreasonably confident at times. Um, I, was, uh, I, was, I was fearful much of the time after the highway had been built uh, because I was not up there looking at what was going on right at, in, in those intervening years. Um, when the old man collapsed, uh, it, was very, it hit me very personally. I was uh, shook up by it. Um, Disappointed, of course, that he fell down um, and uh, troubled by the fact that what people wanted from me as a scientist was basically an autopsy of why he fell down. Um, I spent time at the bottom uh, with everybody else who came up here delivering flowers and, uh, and commiserating about what the old man meant uh, to me and, and my family. Uh, it was part of my kids when they grew up. It still is <laughs> today.